Hello, my name is Manoj Kesarvani, and I'm an interventional cardiologist here at UC Davis Medical Center. This lecture is entitled, Doctoring II Preclinical Course, Cardiovascular Physical Exam. It serves as an introduction to the cardiovascular physical exam session. The objectives of the cardiovascular physical exam session are as follows. We would like to provide a general framework when approaching the cardiovascular physical exam, which can be applied to a wide range of patients outside of the cardiology clinic. It can be used in the surgical clinic, the internal medicine clinic, or even the urology clinic. We would like to create an educational but enjoyable nurturing learning climate to practice clinical skills in the cardiovascular physical exam with real live patients. And above all else, to demonstrate the value of the science and art of medicine as it relates to cardiovascular disease. Here are some key points in terms of the cardiovascular physical exam. It's important to remember the cardiovascular physical exam is a multi-sensory experience that requires integration of inspection, palpation, and auscultation in the context of initial symptoms and patient history. When performed correctly with attention to all of the modalities mentioned above, most structural cardiac abnormalities can be accurately detected or considered in a differential diagnosis. This underscores the critical importance of a cardiovascular physical exam. However, the cardiovascular physical exam has been under attack due to an apparent decline in cardiovascular physical exam skills, which is thought to be in part related to scarcity of good teaching patients, lack of teaching time at the bedside, promotion of new, more expensive diagnostic modalities, and a shortage of clinically oriented instructors competent in the cardiovascular physical exam. In terms of scarcity of good teaching patients, this is truly hogwash. Any patient with a heart is a good teaching patient. This is particularly true of the patients who have volunteered to participate in a cardiovascular physical exam session. As far as lack of teaching time at the bedside, I think that any student who rotates on the CCU rotation here at UC Davis Medical Center will clearly see the critical importance that a cardiovascular physical exam has in the care of patients. For example, in a patient with systolic heart failure, one cannot determine whether a patient should be diuresed with intravenous diuretics without doing a proper exam. So by that very nature, teaching has to occur at the bedside. As far as promotion of new, more expensive diagnostic modalities, it's important to remember with certain diagnoses such as aortic stenosis, an echocardiogram, although considered a definitive study, may underestimate the degree of aortic stenosis in a patient. That's where the physical exam comes into play. One may hear a significant cardiac murmur significant with, excuse me, consistent with severe aortic stenosis, although the echocardiogram suggests it's mild to moderate. One has to reconcile that, and the only way to reconcile that is by doing a proper cardiovascular physical exam. Additional studies may be necessary in that scenario. And as far as a shortage of clinically oriented instructors competent in the cardiovascular physical exam, I think the cardiovascular physical exam session will prove otherwise. The essential components of a cardiovascular physical exam include the following. It's very important to review vital signs. This will allow one to determine whether a patient has high acuity in terms of their cardiac issues. Pulse palpation auscultation is very critical. This specifically refers to pulse palpation of the carotid artery, as well as distal pulses, including the radial arteries bilaterally. Vein observation is also critical, particularly as it relates to determining jugular venous pressure and if distension is present. Chest inspection and palpation are also important. Cardiac percussion, palpation, auscultation. With regard to cardiac percussion, I must admit this is not a technique that's frequently used, but in certain situations it can be very helpful, such as in a patient that has a large pericardial effusion. It's also important to remember that a patient with cardiac disease will have findings outside of the cardiovascular physical exam. So it's important to remember that lung examination, including percussion, palpation, auscultation, 
are a critical component in patients being valid with cardiac disease. In fact, the lung examination is a part of the cardiovascular physical exam. And certainly, extremity and abdomen examination is also important. If one has a abdominal aortic aneurysm or a brewery in the abdomen that might suggest renal artery stenosis, it's important to recognize this as this is associated with cardiovascular disease. In terms of the basic anatomy topography of the heart, it's important to remember the heart is located in the middle of the thorax within the mediastinum. Specifically, it's between the third and sixth coastal cartilages. And as all of you know, the heart functions to supply tissues throughout the body with oxygenated blood. While the exact position is variable among patients, the heart tends to lie fairly horizontal with the apex directed towards the patient's left side. However, there are situations such as dextrocardia where the heart is on the opposite side of a body. And this will result in differences in terms of cardiac oscillation when a patient has aortic stenosis, for example. And so it's important to recognize the normal anatomy topography of the heart so that when patients have situations of dextrocardia, it can be recognized. Let's now focus on inspection. Although many physicians reach straight for their stethoscope when performing a cardiovascular physical exam, a great deal can be learned about the patient through inspection and palpation. For an experienced physician, this often is done instinctively when first meeting a patient during the history portion. By simply asking a patient simple questions and watching them as they answer those questions, a lot can be learned about the acuity of the patient's cardiac disease. During inspection, it's also important to ask oneself some simple questions. How does a patient eyeball? In other words, is a patient in any distress? So a patient with cardiac disease may present with respiratory distress, which is evident based on the use of accessory muscles and vital signs, such as an elevated respiratory rate, or oxygen saturation by pulse oximetry that is on the low side, as well as a level of alertness. Distress from chest pain can also be obvious. There's something called Levine's sign, referring to the fact that a patient may reach towards their chest in the heart area with a clenched fist, suggesting quite a bit of distress related to the chest pain. Additionally, inspecting the chest contour, looking in particular for any deformities such as pectus excavatum or coronatum can be very important. Pectus excavatum is when the sternum is concave in. Pectus coronatum refers to protrusion of the sternum. It's protruding more than usual. As far as pectus excavatum, maybe a better definition might be a patient that has a sternum that's sunken into his or her chest. Let's now discuss venous observation. This specifically refers to jugular venous pressure. The estimate of jugular venous pressure allows for a non-invasive assessment of central venous pressure, in other words, right atrial pressure. The assessment of jugular venous pressure, in fact, is a critical component of the cardiovascular physical exam. In addition, it is often inadequately performed and undervalued. Whenever one is beginning to assess jugular venous pressure, it's important to think about the anatomy of the neck. So when we think about the anatomy of the neck, we want to think of the two bellies of the sternocleid mastoid muscle as depicted by the laser pointer, as well as the clavicular head. And so we have a scalene triangle where we now can recognize the course of the internal jugular vein as well as the carotid artery right next to one another. Now this figure to the right, obviously you don't have this illustration with every patient. And so we have to think about landmarks that help denote where the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid and mastoid muscle are present as well as the clavicular head. So we can identify the scalene triangle and the course of the internal jugular vein as well as the carotid artery. Shown here also is in a prominent external jugular vein. It's important to recognize that a prominent external jugular vein may be seen in patients that have normal right atrial pressure. Another key component to the assessment of jugular venous pressure is proper positioning and finding the actual meniscus of the jugular venous pressure. That's the top of the column. 
So it's important to remember the patient has to lie comfortably at an angle that brings the pulsating column into view. This often may be at 10 degrees, 30 degrees, or even as high as 45 degrees. The head lies on the pillow with the shoulders on the mattress, relaxing the sternocleidal and mastoid muscles. And then the heel examiner's left palm gently adjusts the head rotation angulation. I think now is a good moment to mention that the contact that a physician has with a patient is part of the art of medicine that can be very meaningful. Also, the way that one positions a patient's head should be done in a confident yet gentle manner. In the right hand, one should carry a flashlight so that tangential light can be administered towards the right neck. Once the meniscus has been located, its anatomic site is noted, and its height above the sternal angle is measured using a ruler held vertically and a pelt, excuse me, and a pen held horizontally to that site. But in order to better see that meniscus, we have several techniques. One is referred to or called the abdominal jugular reflex. This refers to the idea of using one's hand and gently pushing on the stomach. This can result in an increase in jugular venous pressure that's very transient, but will help the examiner identify the meniscus. There are times when a abdominal jugular reflex is used that the jugular venous pressure stays distended, which would suggest that the patient's filling pressures are elevated. Related to the abdominal jugular reflex is the hepatojugular reflex. What's different about the hepatojugular reflex relative to the abdominal jugular reflex is that one is using their hand to push in the right upper quadrant in the liver region. And so, like the dominant jugular reflex, this will result in a transient increase in jugular venous pressure that will allow for the elucidation of the meniscus of the jugular venous pressure. Oftentimes, we will use a hepatojugular reflex, but find that the patient's very uncomfortable, in which case, perhaps a dominant reflex may be a better technique. Another technique to identify the meniscus is the idea of looking for jugular venous collapse with inspiration. So when one inspires, the capacitance of the pulmonary vessels increases, so that causes a paradoxical collapse in jugular venous pressure while all other structures in the neck become distended. And finally, another technique to confirm the meniscus is palpation. You should not be able to palpate the jugular vein. However, you will be able to palpate a carotid pulsation. And so if you're able to palpate a pulsation, that is consistent with a carotid artery and one should look elsewhere to identify the jugular venous pressure. Now, in terms of measuring jugular venous pressure using the sternal angle, the angle of Louis, what one needs to do is position a ruler in vertical fashion as shown here from the sternal angle. Then there is another ruler that is placed horizontally at the meniscus of the jugular venous pressure, and this height of the vertical ruler in centimeters of water is a jugular venous pressure. But remember, the measurement of jugular venous pressure is actually from the right atrium. So, in general, from the right atrium to the angle Louis is five centimeters. So you will add five centimeters to the measurement. In this case, the jugular venous pressure measured from the sternal angle, the angle Louis was three centimeters. So if we add five more centimeters, the actual jugular venous pressure is eight centimeters. The issue with this technique of using the sternal angle is that patients have different body habitus and may have a chest wall and five centimeters of water from the right atrium to the sternal angle may not be correct. So I prefer a different technique of using the mid axillary line. The mid axillary line is an imaginary line that divides a chest wall in half. I think that this is a better approximation of the location of the right atrium. Then two rulers are used again to measure the height of the jugular venous pressure in centimeters of water. So again, you have a vertical ruler and a horizontal ruler. The horizontal ruler is positioned at the meniscus and where it intersects the vertical ruler in centimeters of water is a jugular venous pressure. So in this case, no additional changes need to be made in that measurement. You're directly measuring the jugular venous pressure. So to summarize, the keys to successful measurement are first to think about anatomy and identify landmarks as we discussed in the previous slide. 
We also want to make sure that we position the patient appropriately. We want to use tangential lighting as well to really make sure that we see the meniscus properly. And then we want to identify the meniscus. Again, we're going to utilize a abdominal jugular and or hepatojugular reflex. We're going to confirm jugular venous collapse with inspiration. And a final confirmatory step is to palpate to ensure that it is not due to arterial pulsation or carotid arterial pulsation to be more specific. And then you're going to measure using a ruler from either the sternal angle where you're going to add five centimeters of water or the mid axillary line that allows for a more direct measurement of the jugular venous pressure. Moving on now, pulse palpation and auscultation is also really critical. And when we talk about pulse palpation, we're principally talking about the carotid artery in this situation. So that begins with observation. For example, in patients that are very hypertensive, we may find a very prominent and bounding pulsation just by observation. Then one is going to auscultate. Auscultation is typically done with a bell oscilloscope because a brewery, a carotid brewery, is a low frequency sound. It's also helpful to ask the patient to hold their breath so that air movement through the airway does not obscure the sound of a carotid brewery. After auscultation, pulse palpation of the carotid arteries is very appropriate. Obviously, it's very important to do one artery at a time because of the fact that if you palpate both arteries at the same time and if there's bilateral significant carotid artery disease, that might result in syncope. Palpation of the carotid artery is done by placing two to three fingers near the upper neck between the sternomastoid muscle and trachea roughly at the level of the cricoid cartilage. Palpation of the carotid sinus located at the level of the top of the thyroid cartilage should be avoided if possible. This has to do with the fact that stimulation of the carotid sinus will actually activate the parasympathetic system, which might result in AV nodal blockade and a substantive decrease in heart rate. In order for one to do that, one would need to palpate with a good amount of force or pressure. Exploring pulse palpation and auscultation in a little bit more detail, it's important to recognize that there are certain diseases that can be associated with a carotid pulse amplitude. So to begin with, this shows the carotid pulsation of a patient who has no pathology, a normal patient. However, in a patient that has hypertension, they can have a bounding and prominent carotid pulsation as shown here. This is a bounding and prominent pulsation as compared to a normal patient. In patients that have aortic insufficiency, their carotid pulsation can be jerky with full expansion followed by sudden collapse. There are certain eponyms to refer to this, such as corrigans or a water hammer pulse. That's shown here. So again, it's jerky with full expansion followed by sudden collapse. If we look at the blood pressure of a patient that has significant aortic insufficiency will see that they have a wide pulse pressure. And then patients have aortic valve stenosis. Those patients, when they have severe aortic valve stenosis, have a carotid pulse amplitude that is low in amplitude as well as volume. This is often referred to as pulsus parvus et tardis. This is depicted here where clearly you have a carotid pulsation that's decreased in terms of amplitude, low in amplitude and volume, and delayed. And that has to do with the fact that with aortic valve stenosis, the valve does not open up as much as it would in a normal patient, and so ejection of blood through the valve is delayed and arrives at the carotid artery in a delayed fashion as well. Then patients can have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That's often described as a double peaked or bifid pulse with a rapid rise, a spike in dome pattern. That's shown here, a spike and then dome pattern. Before we move on, it's important to also recognize this carotid pulsation. So this carotid pulsation is similar to one associated with a patient of aortic stenosis, but here there's no delay in the carotid pulsation. This might be a patient that has hypotension, or septic or distributive shock where the blood pressure is low. Moving on now, patients can have a bifid pulse 
that's normal or delayed in its rise. This is referred to as pulsus bisiferens. This can occur in combined aortic insufficiency and aortic stenosis, and it's depicted by this tracing here. So you can see that there is a rapid rise in this patient, or I should say more of a delayed rise relative to a new patient, more of a delayed rise, and then you can see that it has a rabbit ear appearance because there's bifid component to this. Now patients that have carotid artery disease can have a diminished unilaterally or bilaterally carotid pulsation, often with a systolic bruit. Let's now talk about palpation, a precordial heave. The way one feels for a precordial heave is to take the palm of their right or left hand and they place it over the heart, generally on the left side of the chest, and they look to see if their hand is getting pushed up, or they feel to see if their hand is getting pushed up. Commonly, a right ventricular precordial heave is appreciated. Certainly, there are left ventricular precordial heaves, or I should say a left ventricular heave. Those are usually more laterally displaced because of the fact that the right ventricle is more anterior and the left ventricle is just behind it. And so if there's enlargement of the left ventricle resulting in a heave, it's going to be more laterally displaced relative to the right ventricle. Another key component in palpation is the apical impulse, or what is also known as a point of maximal impulse, often referred to simply as a PMI. You want to pay attention to the location. A PMI is considered to be laterally displaced when it's beyond the left midclavicular line. So in this illustration, the midclavicular line divides the clavicle and it's along this way. And so if a point of maximal impulse is laterally displaced relative to this line, that is consistent with a laterally displaced PMI. However, it's important not only to pay attention to location, but also the size of that apical impulse. If the diameter is greater than three centimeters, there's left ventricular enlargement that is likely present. For practical purposes, the size is often described in terms of the size of coins, whether it's quarter size or half dollar size. We know a half dollar is about three centimeters, we know a quarter is about 2.43 centimeters. And so the size on the order of a half dollar or larger, then we know that left ventricular enlargement is likely present. Let's move on now and talk about the auscultation technique. We always like to start over the aortic area in the second right intercostal space using the diaphragm of the stethoscope, as shown in this illustration. And so we want to listen and take our time in this position. Once we feel we've adequately listened in the aortic position, then we move on to the pulmonic area, which is in the second left intercostal space, as shown in the illustration here. Then we inch down the sternal border to the tricuspid area, which is the fourth left intercostal space. It's important in this location to listen with both the bell and the diaphragm of the stethoscope. The bell is really ideal to listen for low frequency sounds, which are commonly S3 or S4 gallops. S3 or S4 gallops are often produced by the left ventricle, which is why it's very helpful to listen in this area with the bell of the stethoscope. Then one is gonna to inch towards the mitral area in the fourth or fifth left intercostal space and along the mid-clavicular and mid-axillary lines. Again, it's very important to listen with the bell and diaphragm of the stethoscope because one may be able to pick up a gallop in this location. Another important point is to remember in general, try to listen to at least five to six locations in total. The reason why this is important is that if one listens in these four stereotypical positions, one may miss a more subtle murmur. And so that's why I have very carefully mentioned in this slide the importance of inching down from one location to the other and to make sure that you listen at least five or six locations. It's also important to emphasize that positioning a patient in the left lateral decubitus position might be very helpful to bring out sounds, or abnormal sounds in particular, associated with mitral valve pathology. Let's talk a little bit about murmurs. Murmurs were described first by René Lennock, a French physician in 1819, after which the significance of murmur became a matter of debate. By the late 19th century, many physicians regarded systolic murmurs as organic, 
whereas others believe that they were often functional. Samuel Levine became a central figure in separating functional from organic systolic murmurs. Freeman and Levine's 1933 study of 1,000 non-cardiac subjects determined the frequency, cause, and significance of systolic murmurs. So hence, we have developed the Levine grading scale. This is a numeric scoring system to characterize the intensity or the loudness of a heart murmur. It's usually written down as a fraction of six and in Roman numerals as shown here. So let's go through the six grades of a murmur. So a grade one murmur is only audible after carefully listening for some time. So one will place a stethoscope, for example, in the aortic position, and it will take maybe three or four beats before the murmur is recognized. Then we have grade two murmurs. Grade two murmurs are faint, but immediately audible upon placing the stethoscope to the chest. Then we have grade three murmurs. These are loud murmurs that are readily audible, but with no thrill. And grade four murmurs. These are loud murmurs with a thrill. So what differentiates a grade three from a grade four murmur is that thrill. A thrill is a vibratory sensation. For example, one may think of a thrill as being produced by a very turbulent murmur that produces so much kinetic energy, it's converted into a vibration, a buzzing sensation that is felt. A grade five murmur is a loud murmur with a thrill, which is so loud that it's audible with only the rim of the stethoscope touching the chest. Then we have grade six murmurs. These are loud murmurs with a thrill, which are audible with the stethoscope not touching the chest but lifted just barely off of it. So let's talk about how one should describe a cardiac murmur. First, you should begin with a grade of a murmur as we discussed in the previous slide. Then think about the timing of a murmur in relation to S1 or S2. As all of you know from your previous lectures, that S1 is produced by the closure of the mitral and tricuspid valves. So S1 is best heard in the mitral and tricuspid positions. Whereas an S2 is produced by closure of the aortic and pulmonic valves. So these are best heard in the aortic and pulmonic positions. By recognizing whether you're hearing S1 or S2, one will be able to easily differentiate between a systolic or diastolic murmur because a systolic murmur is going to come immediately after S1 and it's going to end by S2, whereas a diastolic murmur is going to come after S2. We describe murmurs as systolic, diastolic, or continuous. We also want to think about the duration of a murmur. This means thinking of murmurs in terms of whether they're whole systolic versus early or late systolic. We also want to think about holodiastolic murmurs and continuous murmurs. The classic example of a continuous murmur is a patent ductus arteriosus. It's also important to think about the location of a murmur. In other words, where is a murmur best heard? Is it best heard on the right upper sternal border, the left upper sternal border, the left lower sternal border, or the apex, or the mitral position? We can get a lot of clues as far as the etiology of a murmur, the cause for a murmur, by thinking about where it radiates to. Does it radiate to the carotid arteries? Does it radiate to both of them bilaterally, or just the left one or right one? You also want to think about whether the murmur radiates towards the left axilla or towards the sternum. And then there are accentuating or physiologic maneuvers that can be done that might make one murmur louder or another murmur less loud. And that can be very helpful as far as establishing a diagnosis. So let's take a moment now and practice this. I am going to play a murmur with a phonogram as shown here. And then I'd like for you to take a moment to be able to describe the murmur in terms of the grade, the timing, the location, where it radiates to, and accentuating physiologic maneuvers. Obviously, because this is a recorded lecture, you will not be able to think about where the murmur radiates to or whether there are any accentuating maneuvers. However, nonetheless, I really want you to focus on the grade of the murmur and the timing of the murmur. We'll also assume for the sake of this example that no thrill is appreciated. Thank <laughs> you.
So this is a grade three out of six, crescendo, decrescendo, mid to late peaking systolic murmur, best heard in the right upper sternal border. If one is able to describe a murmur in this fashion, the diagnosis becomes very obvious. This is a classic murmur of aortic stenosis. Let's explore oscillation in a little bit more detail. Remember, in a normal heart, heart sounds are produced by closure of the valves. It is for this reason we're able to hear S1 and S2. S1 and S2 should both be loud and crisp. Let's now take a second here and talk about abnormalities of S2. One common abnormality is an inaudible S2. An inaudible S2, particularly over the aortic position, or in the second right intercostal space is due to severe aortic stenosis. In severe aortic stenosis, the valve does not open or close very much, and so the second heart sound, or A2, is not well appreciated. Then we can have abnormal splitting of S2. This can be persistently single, persistently split, fixed split, paradoxically split or reverse. When we think of persistently single, again, the example that comes to mind is aortic stenosis, where you do not hear the A2 component of the second heart sound. So remember, S1 is composed of M1, T1. S1 is caused by closure of the mitral valve and tricuspid valve, and S2 is caused by closure of the aortic valve and the pulmonic valve. The reason why the tricuspid and pulmonic valves close later is that they're right-sided structures that are under less pressure. We'll talk in a second why murmurs on the right side of the heart increase with inspiration. Another thing to remember is that the first heart sound, again caused by closure of the atrioventricular valves, identifies the onset of ventricular systole and the second heart sound caused by the closure of the semilunar valves, the onset of diastole. Let's explore a physiology split S2 in more detail. Recall, inspiration results in a decrease in interthoracic pressure and a subsequent increase in venous return. As a result, it takes longer for the pulmonic valve to close. So during expiration, again, S2, we have an A2 and P2 component. And then when a patient takes a deep breath in, what we find is that the pulmonic valve closes later, such that there's a 40 to 60 millisecond difference between A2 and P2. And this actually can be appreciated by anyone's ear, this 40 to 60 millisecond difference. Similarly, when one has, for example, tricuspid regurgitation, and one takes a deep breath in in that situation because there's an increase in venous return to the right side of the heart, there will be a accentuation in that murmur. So again, right side and murmurs always increase with inspiration. Let's now talk about fixed splitting of S2. The classic example is an uncomplicated osseous secundum atrioseptal defect. So you'll learn more about this in your congenital heart disease lecture. This type of atrioseptal defect results in a left to right shunt and a volume overload affecting the right side of the heart. So when we talk about atrioseptal defects, let's focus on this illustration for a second. So this is a slice through the right atrium and right ventricle. And so we're looking at the interatrial septum and the interventricular septum. And so we can have an osseum secundum atrioseptal defect that is generally in the middle of the interatrial septum. We can also have an osseum primum atrioseptal defect that is close or adjacent to the tricuspid valve. And then we can have a sinus venosus atrioseptal defect that can be sometimes close to the superior vena cava or closer to the IVC, the inferior vena cava. It's important to remember that sometimes a patient can have multiple sinus venosus defects. So in a normal patient, A2 and P2 is as follows. But in a patient that has an atrioseptal defect, what we find is in expiration that the pulmonic valve closes later. 
And this again has to do with the fact that there's a volume overload effect in the right side of the heart. There's more volume on the right side of the heart and so it's going to take longer for the pulmonic valve to close. But let's explore this in a little bit more detail on the next slide. So again, recall that inspiration results in a decrease in interthoracic pressure and a subsequent increase in venous return. However, in this situation, the increase in venous return is balanced by a reciprocal decrease in flow through the shunt. Thus, there's no change with inspiration as shown here. So an expiration, as we talked about on the previous slide, compared to a normal patient that doesn't have an atrioseptal defect, what we find is that the pulmonic valve is closing later, such that the difference between A2 and P2 is 60 to 80 milliseconds. When one inspires, because of the balance between the increase in venous return and decreased flow through the shunt, that there is no change. And again, the difference between A2 and P2 is 60 to 80 milliseconds. A persistently split S2. Let's talk about this now. A persistently split S2 is different than a fixed split S2 in that it varies with expiration and inspiration. Typically, it's seen in a right bundle branch block. The reason why it's seen in a right bundle branch block, as you will learn in subsequent lectures, is the fact that a right bundle branch block results in delayed activation of the right ventricle. Because of the delayed activation of the right ventricle, both the tricuspid and pulmonic valves close later. So if we focus on S1 and we're looking at M1 and T1 with inspiration, which again results in an increase in venous return, T1 is going to move a little bit further back. The tricuspid valve is going to be delayed in opening. This is very difficult to detect and when you listen in regions of the mitral and tricuspid valve areas, you will not be able to really notice a difference. However, in the situation of A2 versus P2, when we focus on S2, what happens is that when one inspires with a right bundle branch block, there is going to be a noticeable difference. There is a difference even at baseline compared to a normal patient, but it becomes more obvious when one inspires, when you have an increase in venous return, such that A2 versus P2 now has a difference of 60 to 80 milliseconds. So when, when one listens to the heart, one would be able to appreciate the difference between A2 and P2 in this scenario. But again, the difference between a fixed split S2 versus a persistently split S2 is that there's a difference in expiration versus inspiration in a persistently split S2. Now, we, have gone, we are going to talk about a paradoxically split S2. Yet again, recall that inspiration results in a decrease in interthoracic pressure and a subsequent increase in venous return. But in this scenario, there's a reverse sequence of semilunar valve closure. So in this scenario, the pulmonic valve is actually closing before the aortic valve. This can be due to two categories of issues. First, there can be electrical causes, such as a left bundle branch block. So in a left bundle branch block, what happens is there's delayed activation of the left ventricle such that the aortic valve now is closing after the pulmonic valve. This is very similar also when a patient has a pacemaker and is undergoing right ventricular pacing. There is again going to be de a delay in the activation of the left ventricle. So in expiration, two components of S2 are definitely heard. Now, there also can be mechanical causes, such as systolic heart failure, aortic stenosis, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Now, what's happening here is that there's delayed ejection through the left ventricle, which then again causes the aortic valve to have a delay in closure. And so this all becomes really interesting in the setting of inspiration. Now, compared to normal, what happens is that when a patient inspires, there's an increase in venous return on the right side of the heart, and the pulmonic valve is now closing later, such that now it seems like P2 and A2 are a single component. So a single component S2 is heard. And so that defines a paradoxically split S2. However, for a paradoxically split S2 to actually take place, you need to have an electrical cause 
for the pulmonic valve to close before the aortic valve or a mechanical clause. And these are classic examples as shown here. Let's talk a little bit more about auscultation and talk about systolic clicks. There can be ejection clicks. And a classic example would be a bicuspid aortic valve or a bicuspid pulmonic valve. Again, systolic ejection clicks are associated with bicuspid semilunar valves, specifically bicuspid aortic and pulmonary valve disease. They're typically heard early in systole. That's important to remember. They are typically heard early in systole. And then there are non-ejection clicks. The classic non-ejection click is mitral valve prolapse, which is heard mid to late in systole. Then there are other causes of non-ejection clicks. Other causes of non-ejection clicks include a ventricular septal aneurysm, an atrial septal aneurysm, cardiac tumors like an atrial myxoma, pulmonary hypertension, and systemic hypertension. On auscultation, rubs can also be heard. Patients can have a pericardial friction rod associated with pericarditis. Typically, there are three components to a pericardial friction rub that you'll learn more about in your pericardial disease lecture. Now let's talk about gallops. Gallops are low-pitched sounds. They're best heard with the bell of the stethoscope. Again, typically in the mitral and tricuspid regions. We have an S3 gallop. The exact mechanism is not known for an S3 gallop, but it is related to the left atrial and left ventricular gradient during diastole. An S3 gallop follows S2. It's important to remember then an S3 gallop can be heard in young children as well as young adults, and it can be a completely normal finding. But in older adults, it's commonly associated with systolic heart failure or even diastolic heart failure, and it suggests elevated filling pressures on the left side of the heart. This is the sound of an S3 gallop. an S4 gallop. An S4 gallop is caused by atrial contraction against a stiffened left ventricle. This is typically seen in patients that have hypertensive heart disease. An S4 gallop is considered a pre-systolic sound. It occurs just before S1 in diastole. Remember, you cannot hear an S4 gallop in atrial fibrillation. You cannot hear an S4 gallop in atrial fibrillation. This is because of the fact that there is lack of coronation between the atrium and ventricle. And again, you need to have atrial contraction against a stiffened left ventricle to produce an S4 gallop. An S4 gallop sounds as follows. Lung auscultation. As I made the point earlier in this lecture, lung auscultation is an important component of the cardiovascular physical exam. We want to pay attention to determine if crackles are present. Crackles can be dry or they can be wet, often referred to as rails. When a patient has wet crackles, that suggests that they have pulmonary edema. Dry crackles are typically associated with interstitial lung disease. It's also important to pay attention to symmetry of breath sounds, including decreased breath sounds, which can be associated with a pleural effusion. Patients can also have cardiac asthma and wheezing. You want to pay attention to whether the wheezing is expiratory or inspiratory. Now, patients do not necessarily have to have asthma or reactive airway disease in terms of history, to present with wheezing associated with heart failure. 
And important again to recognize that patients that present with heart failure can have wheezing. And then rubs. Patients can have a pleural rub associated with a pleural effusion. The extremity examination. Pulse palpation of important arteries include the upper extremities. It's important to feel the radial arteries as well as the brachial arteries. You want to determine whether they're symmetric and present in both locations. It's also important to examine the lower extremities and to determine whether dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial arteries can be palpated. Additionally, the popliteal arteries and the common femoral arteries need to be palpated. Disease of the common femoral arteries are often accompanied with auscultation, excuse me, are often accompanied by bruise. So it's very important to not only palpate the common femoral arteries, but to auscultate to determine if bruises are present there that may suggest peripheral arterial disease in this location. With regard to the abdomen, it's important to focus on the size of the abdominal aorta to determine if an abdominal aortic aneurysm is present. But be careful, in very thin people, an aorta can be palpated without them having necessarily an abdominal aortic aneurysm or any pathology of the abdominal aorta at all. In addition, you want to determine whether a brui can be auscultated over the renal arteries that might suggest renal artery stenosis. So palpation is always accompanied with auscultation for bruies, again, in the abdomen. So in terms of grading scale peripheral pulses, we have the basic scale and the traditional scale. Typically, we use a basic scale, where we say it's, if it's normal, it's 2 plus. If it's diminished, it's 1 plus, And if it's absent, it's 0. And then there's a more sophisticated traditional scale that might be used by a vascular surgeon, where we have 4 plus for normal, 3 plus for slightly reduced, 2 plus for markedly reduced, 1 for barely palpable, and 0 for being absent. Another component of the extremity examination is examining for clubbing and cyanosis. So in this illustration, you have the normal angle of the, bed, of the nail bed. In a patient that has clubbing, there can be a distorted angle of the nail bed. The exact pathogenesis of digital clubbing is not completely understood, but it's thought to be plate, related to platelet-derived growth factors and vascular endothelial growth factors being increased in levels, which might be associated with these changes. Peripheral cyanosis is another component of the extremity examination. It is seen in patients who have pulmonary disease, but also can be associated with cyanotic heart disease, as you'll learn in your congenital heart disease lectures. The extremity examination also includes the examination or the component of the exam where we want to determine whether lower extremity edema is present. So we have a grading scale. Basically related to indentation of, of, the, of the lower extremities. And so we, if we can push with a finger and we can see that there is a two millimeter depression, that's consistent with slight pitting edema. And we list that as one plus on the exam note. And then if we're able to depress it to four millimeters, that's considered as two plus, and that's deeper pitting. And then if we're able to depress to six millimeters, that's consistent with three plus, where we say the patient is deep pitting with visible dependent edema. And then we use the term four plus when there's very deep pitting edema, where the depression is to eight millimeters, along with gross distortion of the leg contour from edema. Now, there's certainly situations where a patient has edema where it doesn't meet this criteria, and we use the term trace pitting, which is definitely, excuse me, which is consistent with less than two millimeter depression. And of course, if a patient has no clinical edema, we use a score of zero. Finally, we've gotten to the end of this lecture. So the take home messages. One is, no diagnostic test is a replacement for a well-performed history and physical examination in the management of patients with cardiovascular disease. This cannot be understated. The value of a cardiovascular physical exam is critical. In cardiology, in fact, as I gave the example related to aortic stenosis, the physical exam can never be replaced by a diagnostic study. Diagnostic studies only supplement the physical exam. Another key component is that 
Inspection and palpation are just as essential as auscultation in the cardiovascular physical exam. In addition, the focus during auscultation should not only be on identifying murmurs, but also identifying any abnormalities in S1 or S2 and recognizing clicks, rubs, and gallops. Remember, the long neck, abdominal, and upper lower extremity examinations are all essential components of the cardiovascular physical exam. Now, what to expect on your actual session day? Students will be divided into groups of four to six people and be given the opportunity to examine a patient in the exam room with a faculty facilitator. In each session, there are a total of four patients with various types of cardiac disease. Each group of students will spend 25 to 30 minutes with each patient. Remember to please bring a stethoscope and to dress professionally with your white coat as you would do during any patient interaction. Another component to the course is to remember to visit this website, the HeartSounds website that I have created for second year medical students. The URL is listed here and the website looks as follows. I want you to remember that the videos below or provided on this website are a courtesy of the HeartSounds 3 program the American College of Cardiology. Cardio is a critical part of the cardiovascular exam a clinical, and a clinical skill that requires repetition to achieve adequate proficiency. In fact, it's well documented that with this program, the HeartSounds 3 program, the American College of Cardiology, that one is able to at least watch all these videos as shown here and present on the website at least three times through, that they are able to really improve their ability to auscultate heart murmurs and other cardiac findings. I would say that it's really important to really focus on mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis, and innocent systolic murmur, as well as aortic insufficiency and mitral stenosis. However, when you visit the website, you'll see that there are many more videos. And I think that it's really critical by the time that an individual finishes medical school that they go through all of the videos at least three times to truly master the topic. Again, it cannot be understated. Practice makes perfect. And that's true with a cardiovascular physical exam. Thank you. I greatly appreciate you viewing this video prior to your cardiovascular physical exam session. Please also take the time to visit this website. This is another website that I've created for medical students, residents and house staff, as well as fellows and other faculty. Please be sure to provide any feedback at the link on the type, top right side of the webpage. Thank you so much. I appreciate, again, your time in listening to this lecture.